begin with a simple question. Why are holes round? Is this the way nature intended? Is this the optimal use of material out there? Or is it because all of our nuts, bolts, and screws end up being round and need to fit in a circle? Actually, I contend that it's because mainly this is how we've been making circles and holes for the past 100 or so years. We've used to traditionally a uh, subtractive processes where we start with a block of material and remove away what we don't want. This has actually caused considerable limitations to what we can design and ultimately manufacture, but additive manufacturing is changing all of that. Nowadays, we can use lasers and high energy sources to melt powder, as you can see here in this video, where we are literally depositing a material, a metal in this case, layer by layer, to create intricate 3D objects and shapes. In fact, what you were seeing there was actually this part being made. So yes, we can still make circles, holes, and those sorts of things. But one of the cool things that we couldn't make with any of our current technology that now we can do with added manufacturing is actually change materials as we were going and printing that. This allows us to do all sorts of cool things in terms of functionally grading the material. We want good corrosion resistance here, fatigue resistance there, wear resistant. We can now integrate that, design and integrate that all in a single component. So you may have heard of added manufacturing before under another name, 3D printing. That technology itself has been around for over 30 years, and the name comes from the idea of 3D printing layer by layer by layer. You're adding material versus subtracting it away. Initially, this started out with plastic and polymer systems in the mid-'80s, but now, as I said, in the, really in the last five to 10 years, this has taken off with metals uh, and additive manufacturing. We call it additive because we are manufacturing final goods and products as I'll see and talk about. There are, of course, some challenges. This disruption is both good and bad in that regard. And you can see from this image, depending on how you're trying to make that circular hole, that you can have something called stair-stepping, uh, depending on your layer thicknesses. So early systems, the layers were fairly thick, and so your circle wasn't nice and round. It would actually stair-step. But nowadays, with metals, we're printing layers smaller than your human hair building it up layer by layer and by layer, so that's not an issue. Although we can still run into problems at the top there. Gravity, can't fight that or we're not changing that, can actually cause our uh, material to sink or sag in there. And so while we have this great design and material freedom now, we still have to be very careful about how we think and manufacture these parts. So let me give you a couple of examples to help illustrate this. This particular component right here is a lightweight automotive component. Vincent Morana and Todd Palmer, faculty, here at Penn State, helped us design and lightweight this. Vincent was on the Formula race car team as an undergraduate. And so actually now, we can use computer algorithms to help us determine where exactly do we want to put material. Because again, as we're adding it in there, we're not subtracting it away. We can be much more efficient usage. That allows us to lightweight components like this, which for an automobile means better fuel economy. For a race car, it means a faster car, and Penn State's car is one of the lightest out there, and therefore one of the fastest. But as you can see, there are still some holes in shapes and geometry. The wheel has to, you know, the axle of the wheel has to fit through this, has to connect to the structure on the frame itself, so it has to bolt on there. Challenge, though, as you're printing this particular one, this is what you actually have to make. So the gray in this image is actually the part itself, but the red and the yellow are support structures that are there helping to fight gravity, and at the same time, making sure that your part doesn't warp, warp or curl up. You can think about this as you're heating and cooling, heating and cooling this metal. Things want to curl up like a potato chip, and so you have to be very careful how you're manufacturing this. And in the plastics polymer world, we figure this out. We actually have dissolvable support, so then when it's all said and done, you can dissolve it away. But this particular part was made out of titanium. And now, as you can see in this image, the actual part itself has all of these rigid support structures on there. And so we fabricated this lightweight light, uh, automotive component with this new space age advanced technology added to manufacturing. And then as Corey Dickman, one of our engineers said, you go caveman on it and literally throw it in a vise, hack, cut, grind, and remove away all of these support structures to get rid of them. Not a very uh, precise way of trying to finish off components that you might put on your car. But if you know what you're doing, you can create some very intricate and elaborate structures. Many people say that complexity is free because the computer doesn't care whether you're printing an intricate lattice structure like you see in this image, or whether you're printing a solid structure or you're integrating those two together. So we've used this technique as well to lightweight components. This particular one right here, that lattice or cellular structure goes all the way through this. And it actually helps us lightweight this component. Originally it was about 10 pounds, now it only weighs about six. Because of that, we have more efficient material usage, which allows us to then think about different materials for this process. The other cool thing about this, which you can't see, is that there's actually internal passages that snake through this. 
As I said, this is for oil and gas, so this goes down hole to pump fluid up or down as it spins around. You can't make those sort of channels any other way right now with traditional manufacturing processes. So again, another disruption. If you take that lattice structure and shrink it down, then you can get cool components like this. It may look like a bowling ball to some of you, but this is actually a hip implant. We were fortunate about four or five years ago uh, to meet Robert Cohen and his team at Pipeline Orthopedic. They had the first FDA-approved 3D-printed titanium hip implant. And unfortunately, I don't have this one with me here today because it's probably in somebody's hip right now. But they have now been doing this for several years. And the cool thing, again, with additive manufacturing is we're creating this cellular structure that mimics bone. And so what this allows us to do now is that your blood vessels and things can grow back into it, and it integrates faster, quicker, so you recover quicker, and you get out of the hospital faster. Great opportunities there. You see a lot of smaller components here, but what about bigger things? Well, certainly there are bigger 3D printers out there as well. And I love this one was in our particular lab. This is from Sayaki. Makes parts that are about three feet by two feet by two feet. And I think, man, that's a pretty big part, but I never thought about how big is the machine you need to make that part. And I was so excited on the day that it came in, as you can see here, you can actually stand inside this system. They actually had to take the windows off of the building to be able to get this thing in there. And this is, you know, the ones, uh, parts I've showed you before are all made with powder metal. This actually is feeding in a wire, and instead of a laser, you're using an electron beam there to bombard with electrons and heat it up and melt it. Or you can think of it as robotic welding on steroids. As I said, this one in particular is about three feet by three, uh, two feet by two feet. Sayaki is based up in Chicago, and the big system there, eight feet by eight feet by 20 feet. And this is exciting a lot of the aerospace industry because now you can literally print wing spars and other aerospace components that are lighter weight, much more efficient, much more cost effective, particularly when you're working with titaniums and some of the other alloys out there that are very expensive to make, or very expensive and very difficult to machine. Now with additive manufacturing, it changes this economics, it disrupts them. We've actually built some of our own 3D printers uh, in our lab at the Applied Research Lab. Rich Martikanitz and his team, as you've seen some of the earlier uh, images here, uh, redesigned this uh, laser nozzle, try and take advantage of uh, some of the, the challenges they were running into. In particular, as powder was feeding into this nozzle, it was overheating from the laser that was in there. And so obviously you can't 3D print something if your, your nozzle is clogging up there. So we actually used our 3D printer to 3D print the next part for our new machine. So some of you may have heard of uh, open source, the RepRap movements, the 3D printers that replicate themselves. In some ways, we have this as well. We have used a 3D printer to 3D print components for our new one. And we've taken advantage of additive manufacturing's capability to put internal cooling channels here that help dissipate the heat, better powder flow, better properties, uh, and better production in our own printers. So not only are we creating cool new parts, but we're actually using 3D printing to create better machines and better processes to produce these parts as well. Turns out that trying to dissipate heat, there's a lot of opportunity or a lot of need for that in automotive, aerospace, construction equipment. In this particular project, work with Steve Lynch, Ted Reutzel, and David Saltzman in our lab, 3D printing a heat exchanger. And so one of the cool things that you can do with 3D printing is you can control the surface roughness or surface texture. And so this is actually an exact replica of a commercial version out there, except we 3D printed it. And so very intricate little lattice structures and, and uh, cooling fins that you can see on that. Turns out this guy is 15% more efficient at removing heat, dissipating heat from your system. So that means you're going to get better life, better fuel economy, run your, uh, better performance in your cars, your trucks, aircraft as the case may be. Well, you're probably asking yourself, well, how do we get that better performance? Well, we actually took a commercial system, put it in a large x-ray machine that we had, a CT scanner, computed tomography, and much like when you go into the doctor's office to x-ray yourself to see what's going on inside, we can x-ray metal parts. So you literally put the part in the system, spin it around, x-ray it, and then you can stitch all those together to create a three-dimensional representation of your part. And now with additive manufacturing, you can turn around, take that digital file, and print it on the machine right there in the, other, in the adjacent room. Should be a little scary to think about how easy it is now to reverse engineer components and parts. It's actually causing a lot of disruption and a lot of concern, again, to the supply chain. Now, if I've got a digital file, you know, where do I make things? Where is it most cost effective to do that? I'm used to parts being shipped overseas and coming through customs. If I just email you a file now and you print it, 
Does that get taxed? Does it have to go through customs? More importantly, I can't get a patent on a CAD file or a digital file. So what is this doing to IP and intellectual property? Do we need to move to copywriting and those sorts of things like we do in the song industry? These are all open questions uh, that are out there that a lot of folks are still wrestling with. The other challenge that this creates is that it opens up manufacturing to new sorts of attacks. And actually, in the Department of Homeland Security last year showed that manufacturing infrastructure now is more open or more susceptible to breaches and cybersecurity issues than any other type of infrastructure that we have out there, even energy, water, and IT systems. The IT folks know that you know, people are going to be attacking their systems and trying to get in their data. The manufacturing uh, engineer or, or uh, uh, machinist sitting there looking off plans and figuring out how to mill or lay something isn't necessarily concerned with somebody hacking uh, his data files, as the case may be. But now with added manufacturing, this is a real concern. There's a lot of cool research going on out there in trying to prevent this. We've been working with a colleague of mine, Abdallah Nasser, in the lab, and Sharon Flank at, uh, with the company InfraTrack. These little components right here, little test specimens that we've 3D printed out of titanium. Looking at those, can you tell which one's real and which one's fake? To the naked eye, you can't do that. We can actually, what we do with the multi-material capabilities that we have uh, in the lab, allow us to actually go through and change the material and tag it with a different, uh, ma different metallic component. So you don't, can't see it, it doesn't cause any changes to the structure in that, but when you x-ray it or CT it, as uh, Griffin Jones did for us in the lab, you actually can see that tag in there and now you know it's an authentic part or the real thing. So now with uh, 3D printing and, and added manufacturing, we can anti-counterfeit our components that are out there, of course, that are now also much easier to reverse engineer. Challenge with this, though, is a lot of our design tools and optimization and analysis tools aren't really set up to handle the idea of changing geometry or changing material within a particular component. And there's a lot of disruption that's going on in this field as well. Best analogy or the best uh, hope, if you will, that I've found so far is uh, Minecraft. Kids will sit for hours manipulating different uh, materials, uh, block by block by block, to create intricate, elaborate structures. I want to thank my children and their friends for posing while they were in the midst of building a giant sheep house. Why? Because they could. But this is the sort of capability that we need uh, eventually to come to manufacturing to enable this disruption to continue to progress. It's cool, though, to see that companies, uh, Minecraft has been bought out by Microsoft, and Microsoft, HP, and other industry titans have all joined forces to create new file formats and other capabilities for uh, additive manufacturing and 3D printing. So I'm excited to see what happens there, and it's been really interesting. Watch what's going on in the stock market with all these companies. There's really three big uh, companies out there, uh, publicly traded companies, I should say, that uh, produce 3D printing equipment, Stratasys, X1, and 3D Systems. Not picking on Stratasys here, you can look at all of them, but if you look at the last five years, they, like many of the others, have been on a roller coaster. The hype of additive manufacturing followed by the realities of it. Unfortunately, or fortunately, or maybe unfortunately for them, depends if you're working for this company, uh, this has followed a typical hype cycle that we see with the introduction of a lot of new technologies. There's some sort of technology trigger that comes along. If you recall uh, four or five years ago, President Obama in State of the Union addresses what's talking about 3D printing and additive manufacturing. Uh, America Makes, the National Additive Manufacturing Innovation Institute, had just uh, recently been lost. Stratasys bought MakerBot. And eventually, as those expectations, they start to overshoot the reality of what can actually be achieved. And then at some point, and now unfortunately, it looks like the stock is sort of in the trough of disillusionment there. But I think there's hope. And so as an engineer, you know, the rest of that hype cycle, if you're familiar with this, things do get better. It just takes time. I think we're actually in the slope of enlightenment now. Recently, Forbes uh, reported that uh, job increases, uh, job interest for 3D printing has grown more than 2,000%. Uh, over the past five or six years. I'm an engineer, teach engineering, and I saw one of our foundations recently reported that more than 35% of all engineering jobs require 3D printing skills now. That's really forcing us to think about how do we train, what do we teach, and really scale up the efforts that we're doing so that we can move up to this plateau of productivity. Because the big companies, the GEs of the world and whatnot, Pratt, Lockheed, you name it, the aerospace folks and others are investing heavily. If you missed it, uh, GE uh, a couple months ago bought two uh, 3D printing companies for $1.5 billion. It's a lot of money to be throwing in and around investing this, and they're very serious, as are many others, because they're seeing the positive aspects or the potential of additive manufacturing. I think really where a lot of the excitement from additive manufacturing comes in is because it makes uh, manufacturing fun again. 
And one of the first times I heard this was from Chris Jost, who was president uh, of Imperial Machine and Tool, 50, 60-year-old company, uh, family-owned company, job shop, machine shop, that makes small-run production components for, for military and, and high-end customers and whatnot. And so you walk in there, and it looks like any other machine shop, but if you start to go to the back of the room, you see a small closet back there. Now there's not one, but two 3D printers that are sitting in the back. You can notice the guy in the face mask there, not something that you usually see in a manufacturing facility. Actually, if you go into some of the other service bureaus that are out there, I was uh, CalRAM out in the LA area, go in there and it looks almost like a, a clean shop or a, um, a clean room in terms of their manufacturing facility. You actually have to be very careful with some of this technology. Again, some of this disruption, there's good and bad. These small particles, you've got to be very careful with handling those. They can be inhaled, and some of those, depending on the composition, uh, can actually explode. So it's actually disrupting fire codes, safety codes, all of those sorts of things. They don't really know yet how to deal with this because the technology is fairly new versus uh, the traditional manufacturing uh, machines and capabilities that we're used to dealing with. But nonetheless, it's giving rise to cool new startups. A lot of the disruption happens from you know, new startups that, that have better ideas, better ways of doing this. Again, another company out in LA, literally right amongst all of the big space giants out there, Boeing, Grumman, down the street from SpaceX, among others. Morph 3D uh, is using, they've got some 3D printers there, but they're actually bringing in engineers during lunchtime, holding meetings there, training them uh, in the design and development of their new 3D printed parts. And they are actually getting ready to launch some components into space. You can really, I mean, it's, it should be easy to recognize the importance of light weighting when you're trying to lift off uh, uh, components, uh, rockets and spacecraft. This particular one was a lightweight truss structure uh, that they were able to create, and when they told me, Ivan Madeira, the president told me uh, as they were testing this, actually the nozzle, the traditionally made parts, broke before the truss structure did itself. So in terms of material properties and control, we're really there, and uh, additive is offering lots of benefits. It's also a lot of companies, smaller companies, are starting to take advantage of um, the ability to economically produce small runs of uh, components. So this is a great story that I'll sort of end my talk on here uh, with my last example. Uh, a few years ago, as the price of uh, gold was going through the roof, people were buying up old pocket watches, taking the gold out of the cases, and throwing away the movements. Come along two guys, actually, Penn State uh, alum R.T. Custer and Mac Frederick started a watch company. And they said, hey, we can actually use 3D printing to go and manufacture new watch cases, and we're going to buy up all these movements, install them, and then put a custom band around them. And so as you could see in this video here, once you have the digital files, sending it over to the machine and printing it out is relatively easy. You don't need tooling, fixturing, all this stuff that adds cost to manufacturing. You just print it. And in this case, you have a powder bed system. You saw the dual lasers running in there, so it's fairly economical production. And voila, you have turned something old, pocket watch movement from almost 100 years ago, now into a beautiful wristwatch. And so now you can have these particular components out there. And sure, you know, the watch case still looks like a watch because of the components that are inside. And so all of these, is, again, we're slowly seeing disruption going. I've been reading or seeing some articles on the actual components themselves uh, being 3D printed and assembled those together. But in the meantime, what we can do is with 3D printing, we can now custom order our watches, including any color you want, even if it's black, like my custom version here that I was able to purchase from them. And so uh, it's a very exciting time uh, in terms of 3D printing and additive manufacturing. Time will only tell how long circles uh, or holes will remain circular. And in the meantime, it's very exciting to think that design and manufacturing now is only limited by our imagination. Thank you.